Hello, everybody. I'm very glad to get a chance to discuss this because we've seen an 11-year-old and a 5-year-old, and both of them are very imaginative children. And imagination is a very important part of a child's growing up and learning the difference from fantasy and reality, knowing something about their place in the real world. And it's important to be able to listen to a child express all of their concerns, their fears, their wishes with seriousness. It reminds me of Robert Louis Stevenson, who was born in 1850. He was a very, very ill child. He spent most of his time in bed. But his father used to sit by his bed and tell him wonderful stories that he would have soldiers and fairy tales and giants. He had TB and he was sick for years. But it was very important for this father to spend the time with him. Now, many modern fathers are doing this today, and mothers, and it's extremely important in helping the child really identify what's real, what's in the world, and what is make-believe. Now, all children have a fantastic fantasy life, but in too many cases, it's crushed out of them. A famous Russian psychologist described the following scene. Mommy, mommy, said a four-year-old. Look at that beautiful rainbow in the street. And the mom says, that's not a rainbow, that's a dirty old oil slick. Don't get your feet in it, it's dirty. Well, do you think that child was able to use his imagination? No, he shut it off forever. That's the problem, I think, with certain modern techniques, not allowing children to play, have their fantasies explored, or parents who really care. The Oedipus complex, as explained so beautifully by Freud, may not be as important today in many families, but I still feel it's alive and well. That is because the mothering figure, whether it's a male or a female, it doesn't matter. The one who is caring for the child, giving it warmth and nurture and understanding, it's extremely important for that little girl or boy to become very attached in a secure way to the mothering figure. Now what happens whether it's a boy feeling that way about the mothering figure or the little girl about the father at a, maybe a few months later, maybe at a year, year and a half, it doesn't matter because what happens is that, that each child feels that it's very special to that person and when that bond is interrupted, by a third person that could be the father figure, could be a sibling, could be someone else. When that is interrupted, it's very difficult sometimes for a child to accept that. What they do is that they have a great love affair with the world and with the person that they're the most attached to. And in that case, what happens is that we've seen it so many times, the little girl will say, Oh, mommy, go away so daddy and I can live together and keep house and you can live with grandma and come back at another time. Or the little boy will say, daddy, you go away so mommy and I can be together all the time and we'll just visit you on the weekend. Now, this has been true for centuries and it has nothing to do with modern theories, or divorce, displacement, etc. It doesn't. The child still has this feeling of two leading to three. And that third party, the triad, makes it very difficult. Children have to accept this, but very often they have a difficult time. So what happens? They have what we call the family romance. Many children with their imagination get very angry with their mother for not being there every minute, or their father for going away, or the fathering figure. I've seen this happen with two parents who are male and two parents who are female. It's the one who is not there all the time taking care, the one who is interrupting that bond. And what they do is called splitting. They'll turn the mother into good and bad. And that's why we have all these incredible fairy tales that exemplify those feelings of the child. For example, a beautiful princess or the wicked witch. Now we have dozens and dozens of fairy tales through the centuries 
that repeat this same theme. And let's just take a simple theme that we all know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. That's a very old tale. But in it, as you know, there is this tremendous rivalry because it's usually a stepmother, in this case, the wicked stepmother. The father is married again and he has this beautiful queen. However, she looks in the mirror every day and says, mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? And the mirror answers back, you are my queen. But then what happens one day, guess what? Puberty occurs, the girl is bigger, she's beautiful. And the mother looks in the mirror, and the mirror says back to her, Snow White is the fairest of them all. And the mother wants to send her off to be killed. Now, this is a very common story, and we can see this repeated many times. Now, what do children do in the fairy tales? It used to be that the girls would be the princess and the Prince Charming would come and marry them. I'm very happy to say this is changing now because girls, as we saw in the little five-year-old that we interviewed, is not so interested in being rescued. No, she wants to be the princess who succeeds in killing the monster, in killing the dragon herself. How many little boys do we see being Superman, Spider-Man, Batman, Captain America, wearing the costumes, not wanting to take them off, fantasy, reading the fairy tales, and some of them are so beautiful. Cinderella is one very great example. So many of them have to do with the girl's love of the father and feeling unable to leave the father and get a suitor of her own. One of the most beautiful ones, Bettelheim thinks, is Beauty and the Beast. In the story, as you know, is the beautiful daughter of a merchant who was lost in a forest and somehow was told that he was kidnapped, but he could go back to his home if he would give the youngest daughter to the beast. She does all of that, but she's very unhappy missing her father. At the same time, the beast loves her, and in a little while she begins to love him, doesn't know what to do. She's torn between her father and the beast, but she goes back to the father but then sees the beast is dying and she runs back to the beast and guess what? He turns into a handsome prince. He looks like the boy next door. They get married and in one of the versions, the father actually comes to live with the handsome prince and his daughter. They all three live happily ever after. I had several examples in my practice of children's fantasies and play. I had one little girl of eight who played over and over again Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And I was in supervision at the time, and my supervising analyst said, you're too slow, you're not making interpretation. And I didn't feel it was ready. I just thought she should play on and play this, you know, coming in, it was very important for her. She did have a very beautiful narcissistic mother in real life who paid no attention to her and about five different fathers, stepfathers, because her mother <laughs> married about five times. And this little girl was playing over and over again. I said to little girl, let's call her Mary, Mary, you know what? I think really the wicked witch is mother and that you're really Snow White. Well, she got so upset, she threw the toys on the floor and ran out of the room, and I didn't see her for a couple of weeks. She came back to me, but she never explained why, and I realized not every supervisor, including me, is correct all the time. Anyway, 10 years went by, and I got a phone call from the girl. She was starring in a play. I had not seen her in 10 years. She was now 18, and she was playing Auntie Mame, and she invited me to come, and of course I went, and then we went to lunch across the street from the school. And she said to me, you know, all those years, I knew that mother was the wicked witch and that I was Snow White. But hearing you say it made it true. And she's the only mother I had and I couldn't bear to think a bad thing about her. The word was everything to her, saying it. She knew it and I knew she knew it, but saying it was very, very important. I learned my lesson then about supervision and what not to do. It's very important to use, your, and I say that to all the students, to use your own instincts when you know what's right. You're there in the room with the child, not the supervisor. 
I had another very interesting story about a child's dream. I had a little girl in treatment from about seven or eight, and I saw her again when she was 11. She loved her father, it was very close. She was a tomboy. She played with him, but she got very uncomfortable when she started to develop breasts and she pushed her father away and the father thought, this is very unusual. My daughter used to love me and now, and it was very important to explain that it's very difficult for children in puberty to feel that intimacy and physical closeness with their mother or their father as the way they used to as babies. And sometimes it's very important to explain that to children. Well, when this girl was 12, I saw her again. She had been in summer camp. I hadn't seen her for a while. She came to see me and she said, there's a boy in my camp that I like very much, Jimmy, let's say his name is. And I think that we're gonna go steady one day and I think maybe we're going to different schools, but I want to see him a day. She then came with a dream. She said, I was in summer camp and Jimmy and I were there together and we were both grown up. We were both like 20, really old, and we were getting married. And then I was happy, except there was a staircase leading to a basement. And out of the basement, a strange man, an older man, you know, maybe really old, like 40, came up the stairs and said, don't you remember? You and I were married. I was your first husband. We even had a baby. But that baby now, I think, turned into Jimmy. And she said, I was so happy with that dream, but I had forgotten that I had had another love. Well, it was very clear to me I didn't interpret it, that that was a feeling and a dream of the intimacy of her love for her father when she was a very young little girl. And the fact that he could then be transformed into Jimmy from the camp and they could be happy. Many stories like this that are extremely interesting in helping children learn the real world, the fantasy world, and be able to deal with change and become flexible in their way of handling the events of their lives. The children who continue to use their imagination are called artists. That's who they are. They don't forget their toys and their trains and their dolls and put them in the closet. No, they keep them in their imagination. They write in their diaries, they write books about it, they paint, they compose. They use their imagination throughout their life. Children could do this if it wouldn't be stomped out of them or they feel they have to get a vocation and not just an avocation. But the true artists are the ones who have this imagination as children and it continues. It can be fostered by parents, but it can be fostered by therapists. The therapist can let the child play out the fantasies and go along with them. Go and read the story of Spider-Man or Wonder Woman and know the history of Batman and be able to add to their play and show a great interest in it. They love this. They'll write the stories of their own. They're on very similar themes. And in a little while, they'll explore this and continue with their creative life. And I do believe that good child therapists can be tremendously successful and influential in working with these children. Thanks everybody for watching. I know I had a very good time and I hope you did too. So I'll see you all next time.